All right, everybody, welcome to uh, a, a really a conversation I've been really looking forward to for a while. Uh, this has been a great chance for me to dive into this uh, a kephalos ritual from the PGM, but also really connecting it up to how it's been taken up into contemporary practice. And one of the cool things that I get to do on this channel is talk to experts in the field, one of which uh, I was speaking with yesterday, Dr. Kirsten Switza, about uh, the PGM and the the, the so-called a kephalos ritual, or the steli of Jew, in its uh, Greek magical papyri location. And today I'm really excited to uh, welcome Marco Visconti onto the channel to talk about the uptake of that uh, very ancient you know, fourth century ritual into 20th and 21st century uh, occultism, uh, much under the aegis of uh, Aleister Crowley and, uh, and Thelema. So uh, Marco, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to come hang out with me on the channel and uh, talk about all things Crowleyana. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, Justin. Uh, I've been a fan and a patron for, for a while now, and so thank you for all the good work you do uh, for, you know, like inputting this, you know, the, the esoteric matter uh, under, you know, uh, the lenses of academia in front of a much wider public. I think no, we never had this big public as, as now, <laughs> so it, it's the best time, right, to do, to yeah. do it is. I, th I think so. I think it's it's an interesting moment in the uh, in the sort of development of esoteric, even the past 10 years, where um, there's a big renewed interest with COVID and also things are kind of moving out, but there's still sort of this cultural uh, zeitgeist, I suppose, aside from all the terrible connotations of that word. Um, but um, it's funny you mentioned that because zeitgeist was one of the, the, the terrible movie, right? Yeah, <laughs> it was, yeah, one it was of the really... first movement, move, uh, moment where we had a little bit of more mainstream attention to uh, esoteric matters for all the wrong reasons. I mean, Zeitgeist right. a terrible movie. Maybe you should make a, a video debunking it oh. sometime. <laughs> no, I, one of the things I said I was never going to do on the channel, or, or if I, I would not do it if I could stand it, was I wasn't going to do any like debunking stuff. And the reason okay. why is I feel like part of the reason my attitude of that is, and I got good advice from another YouTuber, is that uh, education is almost always better than debunking because if you engage yeah. in debunking, basically you're on, you're just following on the coattails of the misinformation. And so yeah. it's better just to put out you know, the actual, you know, as best you the can information, yeah, the absolutely. actual information. And, you know, cause if you, if you're on the, t if you follow the coattails of the misinformation, then they always have the, the initiative in, in some ways. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, so Marco, just, uh, for the, for the sake of folks who don't, uh, who don't know you, uh, would you mind introducing yourself and just saying a little bit about your background and, and, um, your relationship to, um, um, Libra Samach and all the stuff that sort of we're, of we'll be talking about today. Of course. So uh, I've been a uh, practicing Thelemic magician for the good part of my life now. I, I, I discovered Crowley by chance in the summer of 1990 when I was 12, which kind of tells me how old I am right now. And uh, it's been it's been a love-hate relationship ever since. Uh, you know, love with the system, uh, with the magical philosophy of Thelema, a little bit more of hate with the character of Crowley because he's always <laughs> been very contentious as a as a person, and I could never really reconcile um, all that he wrote, you know, with my personal and um, ideas and core values. But, um, you know, like, as, like I said, I've been a practicing magician, which means that I sought out initiation into the Thelemic tradition. Um, first in uh, the AA, the Argentum Astrum, which is the magical order of Crowley. Um, and then much later on in Ordo Templariantis, OTO, which is more like the Masonic uh, version mm -hmm. of the initiatory uh, track th that you can find in Thelema. Uh, eventually, I got out of OTO. Um, because of various reasons <laughs> like and uh, and i wrote about it you, it's everything can be found on my uh, on my website which is markovisconti.org if anybody is more curious about reading why i got out of oto but um i still uh, you know even even like if that in the um, you know like that experience didn't pan out the way i wanted i still got uh, I still think the love for Telema and, and my initiations stood, obviously. And, uh, you know, come the pandemic, I started organizing a series of online classes um, centered around Patreon. Uh, and then uh, they became quite successful, to be fair. At some point, I had almost like 200 con con patrons of, like, engaging weekly. We were like every week we were uh, constantly on Zoom, uh, doing magical operations. We um, 
for instance, one thing we did, we, we studied and we practiced the Arbatel uh, grimoire, mm -hmm. which interesting enough, you're going to decide. I heard on the grapevine yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on, on your channel soon. Yep. Um, you know, we, we studied the Goetia, uh, we we discussed the Lemma. And, and as you mentioned, right, like that was like the peak of the lockdown years. And then, you know, that interest started to wane, to wane uh, but there's still a lot of, a lot of interest around those uh, subjects. And from, from those classes, come out my first book, which is called, uh, titled, The Aleister Crowley Manual, Telemic Magic for Modern Times, which I do have a copy. It's just like one of these like proof copies. This is coming out actually uh, in a couple of weeks uh, on February the 14th, which is a perfect Valentine's gift. It's also red, <laughs> as you can see. Uh, who would not gift, uh, you know, uh, Aleister Crowley? Uh, book with a beautiful uh, mega boob bab from Baphomet <laughs> on top of it, right? Um, yeah, uh, the book itself is a practical manual on on magic with the K, which is not you know it's it's a strange it's a strange thing. Maybe we'll discuss it later on. Um, and that's it. That's 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 what I do. Uh, maybe one more thing I should mention is that. Um, I have a new course coming out uh, called Thought Tarot Magic, starting in just a week from now, discussing all the magic hidden in the Toth Tarot deck. Uh, so not so much about just reading the tarot, right? It's about understanding the magical philosophy of Telema hidden in the cards. And, you know, you can you can find it all on, on my website if you are curious to learn more. Yeah, it's a notoriously uh, complex and convoluted system it, of tarot. It, absolutely, not, yeah. uh, you know, one of the things, for instance, like you don't read reversals. How how do how can you not read reversals? Well, there's a reason why. And uh, yeah, yeah, one of the things I'm going to try and entangle. It's going to last for six months, so uh, it's it's a long slog, as they say. Right? <laughs> I like the you need time to to really unpack it all. Uh, that, so yeah, I would believe it. I'd believe it. Um, I also just acknowledge a couple of folks in the chat, um, Andrew and Jason uh, Sobek. Thank you. And also I saw Angela Puka, uh, uh, Hello, Angela. a shared friend of ours, of ours uh, Marco, and, and also just several people who are uh, supporters of the channel on Patreon. Thank you. And I, I see all of you. Thank you guys so much for coming and hanging out with us. Um, Marco, before turning to the uh, before turning to the the uptake of of the of the uh, of the Akephalos ritual into Thelema, I just wanted to see if you had any sort of um, thoughts on the actual Greek magical papyri, the text of the Greek magical papyrus, mm -hmm. uh, so PGM uh, five ninety six and following. Um, as a as a practicing magician, um, I'm just curious if you just sort of take that text. Is there anything that you'd want to uh, that jumps out to you about that text as it stands in the Greek magical papyri, or um, or anything else? I'm just want to think. You know, that text in isolation of its of its uptake into the lema. I was curious what you um, what you might think about the text in a general way. Well, you know, like if my I have a I have a strange relationship with the PGM because there's so much material in it, and uh, in fact, so little has been studied in detail yet. You know, up until a recent time, we were still uh, working with with old translations. We 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 in fact we don't have uh, much information on who even is this Akephalos god and what is the you know the 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 uh, you know the the, the headless right is supposed to do in my experience really is uh an exorcism and it works very well as an exorcism right what's interesting to me what and i think it's one of the things that actually led um crowley and maybe you know the people that passed the the ritual itself onto crowley um to use it so much and to feature so much was the fact that there is quite some evidence that possibly this akephalos really was um a greco-roman take on on the egyptian on the egyptian osiris so, and so it was like you know the uh the god i mean the, the god that goes into the underworld and through the uh to you know, through the to the actions of the initiatrix par excellence which is isis and through the work of 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 their son which is also their half brother, as it's very complex with the Ennead gods, right? Who's yeah. who? Uh, you know, Horus actually, you know, he gets reconstructed, and so, you know, Osiris would eventually become such a fundamental myth in uh, in in contemporary magic, and so, you know, like for me, it's it's one of those staple of, of ceremonial magic because it takes there's an element of mystery around it, right? And in my experience, when there's an element of mystery. 
actually magic is stronger in a way, possibly because you try to, almost like you block your logical mind and you let other um, other other feelings to work out with you. And, and, and emotional magic is the strongest magic that there is. I think I recently heard uh, Dr. Stephen Skinner mentioning it, uh, you know, in uh, in on one podcast that, like, if you if you want to go to the, the demons of the Galatia, you should have a reason for doing that, and you should be emotionally at, at involved into that. You just don't want to call a god or, or a spirit and just say, "Hey, show up! Hi, what are you going to do?" And so, like, the idea that there's there's a lack of uh, knowledge, and so there's a mystery around it, enhances that um, that emotional uh, connection. Uh, I think. Some years ago, I also read a book. Post, if I remember, it was called like the enigmatic. No, I don't really, let me let me show you. Yeah, the enigmatic netherworld books of the solar Osirian unit by John Coleman Darnell. Uh, it's it's not it's not an academic book, right? So it's not something that um, does prove anything, right? Uh, but also, it's not in the in the realm of the zeitgeist uh, craziness we were discussing before. And once again, uh, he kind of points out the idea that um, the, in, uh, in, the, in the PGM uh, material, in other points, Akephalos is referred to Bess, and Bess mm -hmm. is you know, this dwarf god, which, could, which, which does kind of speak of, of an internal silence, the internal silence that's needed to truly start a magical operation and to end a magical operation as well. You know, it's the, to be silent is one of the four powers of the Sphinx. So... A lot of ideas, as you can see, right? Uh, but it's this is one of the reasons why I think this the, the original text is so interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I should also men mention that you know this connection with Bess. Um, it's so I think it's something that became very prominent in later ascensions, you know, by Kenneth Grant. Bess um, features very heavily in uh, Tiffonian tradition, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was Jake Stratton, Stratton Kent which passed recently, so we should always uh, remember him because he's been one of the greatest of our generation. Uh, in his um, um, commentary on the Headless Rite, it does put, put this, uh, um, highlights this connection, you know, with Best. Uh, it, there's a lot there, right? <laughs> um, I think as you mentioned in the, in, in the video, which was fantastic, by the way, uh, there's so much we don't know and so much we will never possibly know unless we find you know, a new uh, set of documents that can tell us what they mean you know, to do at the beginning or when they were sat down and wrote it. Possibly we will never know. But I think that magic really works even beyond that, like you know, uh, beyond knowing exactly. Like it, it's that emotional connection that once it's forged can really act as a kernel of the magical operation itself. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> Yeah, it did. And, you know, it's, um, and again, I think a lot of it is speculation. I'll, however, I will say that uh, from my conversation and my my continued conversation with Dr. Svitsa, um, that an entire monograph on the Akephalos is uh, coming out here just Ooh. shortly. So, okay. uh, yeah, so there's a, uh, the most exhaustive single study on the Akephalos is actually coming out here uh, in a little bit. And she was able to contact the scholar and get access to it. And so her, her, we'll be discussing it at length in our conversation. So, I don't know to what degree, you know, uh, diminishing the mysterious aspect of the Akephalos will affect the, the the magical side of things, but I do I do look forward to um, you know seeing you know having a little bit of this explained a little bit better, and uh, in our conversation we'll be getting into what what sco where scholarship is now on the Akephalos, and it's come come a long way apparently. I mean, the, the more the more we can, the more we know, the better, right? Uh, I think that at the end of the day, humanity can always find more mystery. So that... yeah. yeah, it doesn't. You don't have to with the, with the Greek magical papyri. You don't have to like scratch hard to find mystery. Exactly. Uh, but um, well, thank you for those. Thank you for those thoughts. Um, let's talk about how this this text kind of enters into the context of you know early twentieth century occultism, and that's in the context of Egyptomania. That mm -hmm. uh, you know, we there's no way not to see Egyptomania sort of all over the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. You know, obviously up into some of the revelations of Crowley. Of course, Crowley famously uh, performed the Bornless Ritual in uh, the interior of the Great Pyramid. It's funny, I was in the interior of the Great Pyramid about 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And that was the one thing I kept thinking. I was like, how much you had to bribe someone back in the day to get in here all night? Uh, you would pay, yeah, you'd exactly. pay a pretty penny to do it now. Um, but, yeah, I mean, when I, when I was there myself, I was thinking exactly the same. And... Uh, um, let's just say that I might have inquired and it was totally out of my pocket. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I think I think you would have to uh, you'd be bribing a big chunk of the Egyptian tourism industry. 
Um, but maybe in the early 20th century, it was a little easier just considering how, you know. We should also remember that at that point in time, Crowley was a millionaire. So, right. you know, like it's. Right. Uh, that's true. It, yeah. He, uh, that's also why he became not a millionaire eventually. I think is it things like that as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about this, uh, this, the impact of Egyptomania on, um, on the, the occult milieu around Crowley. And one of the things that I've always wondered is to what degree is this a bug or a feature, right? That, um, that the environment around Crowley really gets influenced by quasi Egyptian mythology, mm -hmm. although their understanding of Egyptian mythology in the early 20th century was pretty poor compared to now. Um, but to what degree do you think that those, that that was useful or helpful or, uh, or hindrance, um, mm -hmm. things like that. Like, what do you, what do you think about the relationship there of sort of well, the, the Egyptomania and the development of Thelema? So, you know, you ask you like if it was a bug or a feature, I think it, it was both in the sense, right? Um, it's undeniable that Egypt is, I mean, the idea of the ancient magical Egypt is once again a very emotionally loaded idea. It's it's seen as one of the cradles of civilization. Of course, Sumer was the cradle of civilization, but, you know, one of the biggest empires of, of, the, of the ancient times that left us, you know, with beautiful, majestic buildings. And by the way, you know, you mentioned you've been, you've been in Egypt. I've been as well. If any of you listening to this never been in Egypt, maybe try and go because, like, trust me, what you've seen on videos, it's it's not. It's going to shock you when you see like the beauty of it and the sheer, you know, majestic. Uh, everything is great, right? <laughs> it's yeah. it's exactly like where you, where this where everything magic could could happen. Um, so in many ways, that kind of uh, you know that uh, those ideas that that are evoked to this uh, this mythical past are I think it, they are a feature, right? Because again, they play into creating beautiful rituals. They play into creating a beautiful uh, landscape to those rituals. At the same time, as you correctly mentioned, there is I re also think that there's a lot. It becomes a bug when we realize that. Uh, Crowley, but also the Golden Dome before Crowley, mm -hmm. was working with uh, with with faith, with fables, really, with with nothing else. I'm thinking about you know um, one of the biggest books on on ancient Egypt that was going on at the time was um, uh, was called Gerald Massey, and Gerald Massey was a great scholar at the time, but. I mean, I, it wouldn't stand the academic scrutiny this day, right? right. So, I'm, and you know, we're not talking directly of Egypt. We're thinking about you know. Fraser as well, the Golden Bow, uh, another like big um, hit in with anthropology at the time, uh, and we know today that post pretty much everything that's written in this book has been disproven. So, a bit of both in the sense. Uh, what what's problematic maybe in this day and age, in, in 2023 right now, is that a lot of people who approach uh, telemic magic or magic in general, ceremonial magic in general, uh, and maybe they seek out initiation uh, in um, Egyptian Freemasonry, in the golden, in the various you know, golden dome splinter groups that exist today. Maybe they still don't know <laughs> that a lot of the stories that are, that they're being told then they should be seen as legends, should be seen as myth, um, should be seen as going back to in what in Freemasonry is described as time immemorial you know, a time before the time, it's almost like a mythical point in time. A lot of people that I've heard, I spoke with over the years, now they really think that, uh, you know, the the, the Egyptian uh, magic that is described in, in Telema is, is the true Egyptian magic. We we know it's not, right? In Telema especially, we, we have a lot of this, um, almost like this dichotomy between those Telemites who swear by the fact that you know Telema is the latest recension of ancient magic that comes back to Egypt, and people like me that say, well, you know what, maybe not, <laughs> right? <laughs> maybe, maybe we should actually be honest with ourselves and just say, you know, we know better now. That doesn't mean that the magic doesn't work. Uh, magic works for super rational reasons, right? Uh, you sit down, uh, you can, you put together a ritual, you enact the ritual, and and if the ritual brings uh, result, which should do. Uh, I I cannot tell you why it does. Right? We we're not we're not at that point uh, uh, where we know we, we can completely find out the science, you know, as to why magic works. Maybe we'll do one day, but you know, at the same time, to really um, delude yourself into thinking that you're doing the same uh, magical 
uh, rituals as in ancient Egypt, I think it's time we leave that behind. And so we leave that Egypt domain behind, right? Uh, for good, maybe for good. <laughs> so like that. Uh, yeah. 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 And I think that's, you know, I think that's a sort of awakening that most people are coming to, right? When it comes to either Wicca or Druidry or, or Thelema, the idea that there's a continuous connection, you know, back to hoary antiquity. I think yeah. most people can admit, no, the Murray thesis was incorrect. There wasn't a witch cult or there's no direct line, et cetera, et cetera. And again, I agree with you that um, I, I've never, you know, this is a point that Spinoza makes in uh, the theological political tract. He's like, why in the world would anyone believe that what people did back in the day was better? When yeah. we I mean, have every cool. reason to believe that everything they did back in the day was actually worse. I mean, um, I, I'm with you. I'm with you with that. Uh, in magic, there is, in magical circles, there's a lot of that, right? Oh, you know, yeah. we, should, we should go back to to what they were doing 2000 years ago. Why? <laughs> like, why yeah. can we not upgrade it? And in, I'll tell you what, I mean, to be fair, Crowley was really trying to do that. Crowley was trying to create a synthesis of something new. He was also a very keen marketer, or at least he tried to. And so he knew that, you know, if he wanted to sell Telema, um, and at first, I, I'm not saying sell as in just like present Telema to the wider world, but then eventually, when he stopped being a millionaire because he squandered his wealth, right? He also needed to sell books and things like that. Um, he was trying to just present it in a way that people would uh, resonate and, and maybe he was trying to push like the mystery bit too much. Uh, but then again, if you really read the books, like he was trying, to, he was trying to be very modern about it, like incredibly. Sure, sure. Modern. Like he I mean, was the actually process, the entire idea of the Hermetic Kabbalah of, of synthesizing all these things from all over the world is radically modern. It's yeah, yeah. you know, in fact, even the the, the language of of uh, the aim of religion, this you know, the science, you know, that that claim to science is a hyper modern uh, yeah. way of doing things. And so it's absolutely the case that that uh, yeah, when I look at Crowley, I, I really see a man who's has one hand in the past and one hand in a future. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think that's, you know, that's that's what makes him really impressive as a, as a thinker is that he can have a hand in both. And, and you know, the idea is that I think we're always doing that, right? I, that's, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I make absolutely. that point about my own religion, uh, Judaism. I always say, look, what we, the tradition should have a vote, not a veto. And, that, yep. <laughs> you know, I, I, we should always have one hand on tradition, but one hand on modernity and uh, never pretend that we're it's carrying not forward some untampered, tradition uh yeah, no one's doing that. we just end up like uh like it's like uh, worshiping the ashes instead of tending to the flame which is a beautiful uh quote attributed to gustav Mahler, but i don't think it's actually by good Mahler. but the idea is beautiful right like you you pass on the flame you just don't tend to the ashes and uh, right, right. So. i agree and and to uh, to wit uh dr puka reminds us that uh, she did just did an episode about this issue in wicca just uh last week so uh folks are interested in this question about the relationship especially wicca to the remote past uh definitely check out dr puka's episode um there marco any speculation on how the steli of geo ended up in the hermetic order of the golden dawn i mean my my guess was bennett just because you know, uh, Bennett seems to be the foundation floor for, you know, seven, seven, seven basically was mostly yeah. compiled by him. And he seemed like he was the, you know, you know, well, him along with Mathers were the, were the real bookish kind of guys, yeah. uh, really knee deep in translation work and, and sort of the accumulatory work. So I speculated it was, was Bennett, but that's total speculation. Do you have any speculation that you would put forward in terms of who do you think might've been responsible for injecting it into that milieu? I mean, um, I actually reached out to a lot of like Golden Dawn folks, and we don't know. <laughs> like, like there's <laughs> there's no there's no certainty about it. Um, it's definitely possible that Bennett was it because you know Bennett was at the time a member of the Second Order of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. He was working, uh, was living with Crowley for a while, mm -hmm. and you know Crowley considered him his teacher for, for right. a while. I mean, it's definitely true that they did a lot of magic together because uh, Alan Bennett was kind of destitute and and Crowley was living very fancy in Chancery Lane at the time and so they invited to to live with him uh, as ex in exchange for Bennett teaching him magic and we're talking this uh by the time Crowley was still member of the Golden Dawn so before 1900 so we're talking like late 1800s here um what I think that the the real um, the person that actually brought um, you know, the, the PGM in, well, the, the state of jail into the Golden Dawn tradition, maybe it's Mathers himself. Mm -hmm. Because Mathers was, at the time, Mathers was a career magician, right? He was, he was really like literally living um, and making a living out of being a magician, a professional magician, if you want. And, and he was very, he was a polyglot and he was very interested in translating things. 
even if it's translations, they really don't. They didn't stand the test of time, okay? Uh, but at the time, it was always, almost pretty much like always there at the British Muse Museum, which at the time also held the British Library, uh, always trying to find new things and uh, translate things. So it's very possible that it was Mathers himself, to be fair. Yeah, but but like I said, that makes sense too. Mathers like, were Greek, so. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like he, he, he knew several languages. Right, and right, right. So like, it's very, very possible. Um, also, you know, like it would make sense that if if these Akephalos can be really traced back to Osiris, it would make sense that something like that would, would catch up the, the, the interest of matters because Osiris is such a fundamental figure in the Golden Dawn rituals. So, you know, like as again, it's it's speculation. I don't think we'll ever know. Uh, but in many ways, it well, I, I think there's another reason why we should be grateful for for, the, for all the golden what, what all the work that the golden dome people did, right? I mean, the, they single-endedly created the Western esoteric tradition as we know it today. Um, again, with some good things, some bad things, right? But um, the work they were doing at the time it was impressive by today's standards, right? Sure. No, it was a heroic effort. I mean, I, I always say this to people: it's like you know, one of the things that that really mark out early 20th century occultists. Uh, in my experience from late 20th century the cult is, is like language skills yeah it's amazing especially in america for americans how monolingual americans are and yeah. even in the early 20 in the late uh 19th century early 20th century latin and greek would have been just part of the the diet of any college education and so it's amazing how much uh the paucity the poverty of classical languages uh compared to from then compared to to now and now i would yeah, say yeah. you know for me I, I would try to work in the original languages as, as much as possible just because you know these texts yeah. aren't translatable often they're they're often highly technical magical <laughs> texts are often highly technical they are a technology and so if you've ever read a technical manual and you wonder why is there so much jargon because they're technical, <laughs> technical and, exactly. and, and magical texts are, are, are a technology they're an ancient technology or and a modern technology as well and so we should be unsurprised that they are not just uh, simple language and therefore learning the original languages, Latin, yeah. Greek, or Hebrew, what have you, uh, are quintessentially important. And, and Mather certainly uh, lived up to that. Crowley as well. Crowley spoke several languages. Um, you know, I'm just going to interject you for a second because on the, on the, on the importance of translation, right? Um, when I grew up, the only uh, book you could find on Crowley in the 90s in Italy was magic, you know, magic interior practice, but it was the a translation from English to Italian uh, of, a, of the Kenneth Grant and John Simons edition. The problem is that the translator clearly did not understand what he was translating, and so there are entire chunks that were missing. It was only like in 2020 that the Ordo Tempiorentis Italia uh, finally released a, a, a great translation to be fair i bought it and it's fantastic but yeah i mean like <laughs> i remember growing up it's like oh this doesn't make sense oh maybe yeah. I'm, I'm stupid <laughs> maybe i don't understand it right and then you know eventually I, I got the the english version the blue brick and i was like oh that part was not translated or part we're missing right oh, and yeah. i think in the grimoire tradition this happened all the time like that's oh, why yeah. we, all these bits and pieces completely scattered around so well yeah. my favorite example is in the in the emerald tablet of hermes trismegistus there's an arabic word that's just transliterated into latin uh telesmi <laughs> and uh of course, the Latin speakers after the 11th century couldn't, they didn't understand Arabic anymore. And so this word telesmi, which is a relatively common word, talisman, in mm -hmm. Arabic, uh, any Arabic speaker would have known what it was. Uh, the Rome, the Latins didn't understand it at all. And so they just heaped tons and tons and tons of misinterpretation of what this word oh, telesmi was. <laughs> well, it has to be something. Uh, and it turns out it's it's just the word for, for talisman, uh, yeah. uh, which is not exactly a non-technical word, but it's not a, a strange word if you understand some. Yeah, yeah basic esoteric uh, Arabic. So yeah, it's it's these kinds of things that really can really uh, can really yeah, Azat is another great example someone says in the uh, um, the chat it's just a word for mercury um, in in Arabic. So so the first time we see the the transition from the Akephalos rite to the bornless ritual, right, is in the in, is in the Goetia. Yeah. Um, so what's going on there? That's a, you know, one of the things that's, I remember when I first picked up the Goetia or whatever, when I was a yeah, just teenager, or early 20s, uh, when I was trying to learn about this stuff, I was like, so the Goetia, so as far as I understood, it was a text about summoning demons or daimons um, mm -hmm. in, in, in some sense of the term. And yet the, the text that they provided as a preliminary invocation struck me as an exorcism. Yeah. And, exactly. I, it always, it, and I was always like, 
which one is it folks like are we are we, are we driving them out we're we bringing them in like you got to tell me what direction we're going here and so it always struck me as unusual that this uh greek magical greek magical text was appended to the very beginning of a 17th century english yeah. you know uh, text of of uh goetic magic and so that always struck me as very weird um but I'm, I'm wondering if you can help maybe people understand a little better what was going on why it is that matters and crowley crowley specifically i think uh, appended uh, that text to the very beginning of the of the goetia so first of all i i should uh, preface what i'm going to say to say this is these are my impressions right it's it, it, i'm always say this because in magic uh, you have a million different perspective and everybody wants to be like the perspective this is my perspective um if anybody knows better please get in touch i'm curious right <laughs> i really think that um we we're, we're getting in that point in time uh crowley was was already starting to work towards trying to figure out a ritual that would work uh, for the um, the knowledge and conversation with Holy Guardian Angel, which is fundamental step in initiation that was it's not original in in Telema, uh, but it was it definitely is one very important step in Telema, um, and so he kind of felt that you know there was some power in this exorcism, uh, maybe some power that would actually. Um, be helpful in cleansing oneself in order to, and so exercise all the you know, the parts that shouldn't be there in yourself in order to receive eventually the uh, the, the knowledge and conversation, the union with the Holy Guardian Angel. Uh, maybe we'll discuss a little bit more of this later. Yeah, on. we will. Yeah, but the point is that, and so it feels to me that um, since you know having that kind of uh, initiation from the divine, so the the, the union with the angel, kind of is in, fundamental in order to do all magics correctly, at least in 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 Crowley's uh, point of view. Maybe he just put it there, like so. He was like, okay, you know, like let's 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 put a little bit of preparation on the on the magician himself. Let him uh, let him uh, identify uh, with with a much more powerful being, um, a much more powerful conscious consciousness, which is the godhead so that by virtue of being the godhead then it can command the spirits and it can bind the spirits uh remember that at this point crowley did try and uh the abramelian operation which is one old grimoire that's specifically uh tailored towards the knowledge and conversation with the holy Guardian angel interesting enough at the end of the abramelian operation when the angel appears and the angel of course the nature of the angel is interesting to discuss uh, but when that consciousness appear the first things that according to the the abramelian um the, the consciousness tells you is to bind the demons right it's the first so, thing that happens right yeah it, so it's, it's almost like okay you know i've been i've been toiling at this a uh, very complex operation for between six and 18 months you know in the um in the um, the, the abramelian recension that was available to crowley and to me in the 90s uh, it was six months uh eventually georg den uh, did a fantastic job on finding new material tra translating from german and we now know that the original the original text speaks for 18 months uh, i only did it for six <laughs> It's and also the, the the 18 month version is much less strenuous in many ways yeah, than six months exactly. the six month version is like a sprint the 18 month is it, like it, a marathon it, it, it is a sprint right uh, and it, i mean i could do it because i was in my my, my 20s it was before starting university it was just like uh, and you know i was living you know i didn't have a job i was living at home with my parents i just like you know i went away for six months I like like uh, as a spring break pretty much <laughs> but the point being is that um yeah i mean that's it so there is this idea whereby Crowley came from that experience, uh, knew that the Abramelian and the union with the angel was important in order to bind the demons. So possibly he just put it there. Again, this is my own speculation. I never really looked into it. Um, mm -hmm. Possibly because, for you know, let's discuss a little bit more. Maybe I'll tell you why I didn't look into it so much. Yeah, and I guess that when I tried, you know, one of the things I try to do when I read, and this is a lesson I've learned from doing philosophy, is that you know, as we as philosophers, we have a if we're doing our job right, we have what we call sympathetic reading, which mm -hmm. is mean that we try to read a philosopher not to find out where they're wrong, but to find out how they made sense. Yeah. Which is a totally different, it's called a charitable reading. And, you know, the first reaction I had was a very uncharitable reading. And the second reaction when I tried to have a more sympathetic reading was that um, the early understanding of the Goetia when it was coming out in what, 19, 1903, 1904. Yeah, something at, like that. Exactly. At, at that point, Crowley still believed that the Goetic demons were 
were psychological Absolutely. compartments. There is that, one that that changed later, right? That changes later, but at this early point, he says they're part of the brain, literally. So and I thought so sorry, sorry, please, please. Yeah, and so my, my point was that maybe what's happening here is that Crowley's understanding the Akafalos ritual, the bornless ritual here, as a kind of auto exorcism where oh. one exercises one's uh one's own consciousness, one's own mind, in order so that if you're focusing on these various goetic entities which are for Crowley, at least at that time, part of one's own mind, part of one's own brain, you kind of clear the slate to invite them in. Yeah. And therefore it's functioning as an auto exorcism and part of that. Now, of course, Crowley changes his mind about the, the nature of both the HGA and, or the Holy Guardian Angel and the Goetic Demons toward the end later in his career. Absolutely. And so uh, that, that was a more sympathetic read I had on what was going on in that text. I don't know if that makes, uh, makes and I sense. think, I think it makes perfect sense. Like you said, like the, we're talking when, at the, at the beginning of the 1900s, when he when he, he publishes uh, his version, which of course it was Mother's version with with, yeah. with, with his editorial comment, right? right. Um, and he throws shade at Mother's in his own yeah, text, exactly. of course, as Curly did all the time. <laughs> right? But yeah, he published that, and there is a part of it called, uh, if I'm not mistaken, like the Initiated Understanding of Ceremonial Magic. That's the the title of the editorial bit, where he really says, like you know, though those demons are part of our psyche. Mm -hmm. Also remember that at the time, you know, psychology was was starting to boom, and right. it was very very interesting. And of course, um, while we have no evidence that I know of, I might be mistaken here, that you know, Crowley and Jung and Freud ever known each other or corresponded. I mean, Crowley was aware of them and was very interested in them. And my non-charitable reading is also that Crowley was always trying to appeal to a mass market. And so, you know, like you have one, something that's that's popular or getting popular, getting, um, you know, mass traction. And that's a way you can actually present these ideas that if not, would seem completely outlandish, like evoking uh, demons. Remember that at the time uh, we were entering the modern era, right? And right. so there was, the Egyptomania was fading, in fact, at the time. Like, right, that's true. The Golden Dawn was already over because the Golden Dawn, uh, you know, finished in the early 1900s. And of course, you know, you had like, the Stella Matutina, the Alpha Omega, all the splinter groups, but they were not, they were not like the the hot thing anymore. Uh, you you went from the Golden Dawn attracting powerful patron actresses, Florence Farr. She was the, the right. chief adept of the Isis Urania temple. And she was she wrote amazing articles, by the way. I don't, I don't know she why her, like, in fact, I think that in many ways she laid the groundwork for a lot of the HGA stuff. And absolutely. Florence Farr has written some of the best articles uh, on that stuff. I don't know why she doesn't, get, like aside it, from the fact misogyny, I don't know why she doesn't get more read. Uh, it, she really should be more read. Uh, just, and just for, for the listeners, it's almost like you have nowadays Margot Robbie, being a ceremonial magician. She was that famous, right? She was like that popular and she was like a fantastic magician. So that time was over. Like the time was going on, was, was not popular anymore, but maybe like psychology was a thing, like science was a thing. So Crowley was really trying to push this idea. And as you mentioned, the idea of maybe exercising even maybe one's ego, right? You know, one, one, one personality to try and focus on all these other parts that might make part of our personality. As you mentioned, though, at the end of his of his life, his perspective would be completely different. Right. Um, a lot of people made the point that uh, um, Crowley was always speaking to different, um, you know, different crowds in different ways. For instance, um, a lot of these things that he was writing in magical um, magical public publication was aimed at magician practitioners initiates. Whereby, if we look uh, magic without tears at the end of his life, he was uh, writing to uh, one person that was basically wanted wanted to become um, her stu uh, his student, but she was not an initiate. And so when she speak when Crowley speaks in Magic Without Tears about all these demons and all these all the all the angels being external, maybe it could be because he was talking to a non initiate. Um, you know, at the end of his life, his ideas and magic were the most clear, and we see it in. The thought uh, in the book of thought. I mean, the book of thought is the summa of telema, telemic magic. Um, so yeah, um, we, yeah we're, this we're, is also I think all the ground here. <laughs> and I think this is also just a lesson in historiography, folks. Um, you know, people say things like, "Well, Crowley said." I'm like, when did Crowley say it? Exactly. Well, look, <laughs> uh, you know, people do people do this all the time with various kinds of things. Well, so and so said that the Bible says. I'm like, yeah, Bible says all kinds of things. Like, I need to know what book, what what's the historical context. We have to be. Um, yeah, we, uh, especially with a, with a person as complex and contradictory as Crowley 
and a person who was as provocative as Crowley and provocatory, it's really important to historicize what he says and then to understand the general you know, what was going on at this time, well, yeah, yeah. Who, who was he talking to, and how his ideas stayed coherent or not, or how they evolved through time. Uh, you might, you may hit a night, uh, the, the nail on the head there. It's like a lot of, you, you find on forums, or Crowley said, but yeah, I mean, like, and then they pick up maybe quotes from completely different points in time, and they just happen to make sense or contradict each other. Um, right. Magicians should learn exegesis better, but we're very bad at that. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Magician. I hung around a lot of uh, a lot of uh, Marxists in my life, and and Marxists and magicians share one thing in common: is that they all left a religion and all joined another one. <laughs> yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. Quote scripture. <laughs> it's 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 they're quoting like in the book of the law it says this, and in and in, in, in this it says this, or in you know in the Commerce Manifesto it says this. And I'm like, all of these systems tell you to, take, to think for yourself, and you're you're quoting you're quoting. Carly Marx to me as if you know he's Jesus on the cross or whatever or Moses and Aaron I'm like hey, look these guys are people and you know of all the things they wanted you to do is think for yourself or whatever for folks who uh, who are asking the person we're talking about is Florence Farr I put a link to her Wikipedia article um, some of her articles are still available and you can get them I think a lot of them published in Equinox and stuff like that but uh, she's a she's a character that again one of these uh, women who just kind of flows under the radar I think Mano White maybe has done some work on her as well. I don't know if she's in her book on I, I'm Scarlet. not sure. I'm not sure it's in that book. I know for I know that there's a um, there's a press here in the UK that just started to re-release her rituals. No, oh. but uh, it's definitely one of those names that should be studied more by academics, yeah. right? Yeah. Because it, she was. Not just a player. She was a, like you think about Pamela Coleman's myth. You know the 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 person who drew the writer uh, waits as myth tower deck. Right. She was great. She was part of the group. But Florence Farr was the leader. She was the yeah. chief adept. Like she was she was a big deal, right? And yeah. uh, we and a powerful intellectual. I mean, that's absolutely. yeah. Like and we're great writer. So yeah. At any rate, um, it's one of those. You know, a lot of the voices I love to uh, you know to champion because I think that she's. Um, so just that important. Um, so let, let's just jump down to to you know where this where this is going to go, right? Uh, so apparently, what the tracking out this document, the next time we really see it is that Curly's clearly recommending it, and it's going to end up in the in the uh, in the, I think one of the diaries of Leah Hersig, who was yeah. I think a, herself yeah. a Scarlet Woman, and uh, and it featured prominently, very prominently in the Abbey of Thelema. Um, do you have any thoughts? I mean, obviously the major thing that's going to happen with the document, and we can talk more about this, is that when Crowley's crossing China, he's going to use it yeah. as uh, as a mechanism for uh, gaining knowledge and conversation with the Holy Guardian Angel. Marco, can you say a little bit about what that is? I mean, these are the two rituals that are the most misunderstood, that and crossing the abyss are, are terribly misunderstood. But <laughs> So we will come back to crossing the abyss maybe later. Um, but could you say something about, the, about um, Crowley... Crowley's use of the ritual there in China. Apparently, I think the, the I think the story I've read is that he was so into it in the astral realm that he he drove his donkey down a uh, uh, his, yeah, he, his donkey fell down a, a hill or something. I mean, at that point in time, he knew that he had to complete certain things that it started much earlier in his time. Right? Uh, he, he tried he tried to complete the Abramelian operation. He didn't complete it, and then. Uh, I think at the, there was this point in time where he pretty much uh, realized that you could use a, a, a summarized version of of the experience, right? And something that you this is Liber Samek, the famous Liber Samek that becomes then one of the uh, magical texts, magical um, rituals of Telem itself. Um, one of the things, so mm, I, I put some notes down here, so I'm just going to look at them very quick. So yes, so. Liber Samic, right? Uh, it's written in 1921. At this point in time, again, like just to situate where in, in Crowley's timeline, at this point in time, he is try he is living in uh, the Abbey of Telema in Shefalu, and he doesn't have much money anymore. So he, he, that's that's a bit of a shaky time for him. And it would get much shakier a few years later when he would be kicked out of Italy by the Mussol uh, Mussolini, the fascist government. Uh, but at that point, in he was living in Shefalu with Lea Hirsig, which was a scarlet woman, so all Australia. And uh, one particular, um, one of the few <laughs> successful students of the AA, 
which was Argentum Astrum, I mean, the magic order that he found in 1907 uh, as a continuation of the Golden Dawn. Um, this uh, Frank Bennett, which also known as Frater Pogradio, comes and visits him in, in the Abbey of Telema. And he is quite an advanced student. He is uh, what it would be called in uh, in the AA parlance a dominus liminis. So he is almost there to you know cross the, um, have the experience of the knowledge and conversation, but not quite yet. And so Crowley just decided to, to pen together this ritual where for him, right, for Frank Bennett, for Frater Pogradio, where he puts like the, the headless right completely reworked, as you mentioned in your video. It becomes like the bornless one here. Possibly again, with this idea of you know exercising your 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 own ego, you know, removing your head and letting something else come down like fire like fresh fire from heaven, which is a uh, technical um phrase you find in in Telema, coming down and fill you up with this divine uh into insight. It should be said that you know, I mean, we could go a lot into um, all the technicalities of the ritual per se. For instance, one thing that should be pointed out that why it's called Liber Samek. Well, Samek is the the Hebrew letter which is attributed to art in the Thoth Tarot. So it's the Liber letter that um, represent the 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 Tarot uh, Major Arcana that is there to. Uh, offer you a pictorial representation of the magnum opus completed. You literally have the, the under changing under together, uh, you know, they're mixing together the fluid in the cup. You have the the the, the red eagle, the white, the white lion. Oh, I never remember the colors correctly, right? But it's, it's like, that. that's it. So that, that's what some, why, why is Samak, right? Mm. It's funny because Samak and the letter Samak in Hebrew just means a tent post. So there um, you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's just funny, like what, 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 how things begin and how things, uh, which is funny because if you see the letter Samach now, it looks like a like a like a circle, a almost a little yeah. line. Yeah. But uh, in the original Paleo Hebrew, it does like it looks like a tent post. A tent post, uh, okay. which it's funny because that's what it, it literally means is tent post. And I should uh, also mention that when when I speak about attributing, you know, the the letters to the tarot, this is Hermetic Kabbalah with the right, Q. Right, right. It has nothing to do with Jewish Kabbalah. <laughs> it's it's it's. I like to discuss um, to define it as a map of a map of reality. It's a map. It's nothing else. It's not yeah, Jewish Kabbalah is an actual mystic, mystic system, complete in itself, whereby we magicians just use the the Cliff Note versions of it, and it's not even correct all the time, right? So the point <laughs> yeah. is that that's why it's called the Bersamic. Right. But I would say that the most important part of the ritual itself, uh, maybe when we look at it from a telemic standpoint, um, it's not so much all the incantations anymore. And again, I'm going to be very controversial. I really know that a lot of telemites will disagree with me, possibly. Uh, but there's one part, the third point, uh, the scolion, uh, where Crowley goes and describes what this ritual is for. I think this is where you get the goods and why, for instance, then eventually used it in the you know in the astral i mean it literally says that you should get so good at this ritual that eventually you just do it in your mind um crowley was trying to synthesize ceremonial magic and yoga he was really trying to synthesize um you know um all the knowledge all the knowledge you would find in the west with all the knowledge of the east that is magic with the k right that is exactly it, it is the synthesis. And so all this ritual becomes something whereby eventually you want just to be able to leave, to, to leave them in your head. Like you would just like to um, be able to internalize them so much that they will act more as a mystical vehicle of um, attainment than something we would discuss, we, we could consider magic. Uh, ceremon I think, again, Stephen Skinner said very correctly that, you know, ceremonial magic, it's something that you do to make changes in the world around you, right? But when you look at telemic magic, really we have something different. We have this synthesis that's much, much more uh, mystical uh, system than anything else. And I guess this is where we get you know, where, where the two things completely part ways. This is where, you know, like we have something that possibly in you know, the original headless right was an exorcism. And then we have like its, its evolution as something that could be used to, uh, to, to prepare the terrain for the conjuration of the demonic forces. But now at the end of the day, when it becomes liver Samek, uh, we have almost like a mystical engine. Um, and I would say something else. If you are going to use Liber Samek today, as it is, 
maybe nothing will happen because remember that that was something that cruelly wrote it for a specific mm -hmm. student. I was going to ask and, about this: is the the degree to which this was custom uh, designed for 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 Bennett, um, and the degree to which um, Again, I'm not a thelemite, so I, I have to be careful here. But it's my understanding that the, the that the that the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Garden Angel is an incredibly personal experience. Exactly. And, exactly. and so that it, 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 there is a kind of strange tension here, where you have on the one hand uh, not only a ritual in Libra Samach, but a really incredible. I think, in my opinion, some of the most incredible writing Crowley ever did is actually the yeah. the commentary in Scully on Libra Samach. I, I I find that to be his best. Um, you know, you 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 will find something in the book of yoga in his comment in his in his, in his treatise on yoga. Um, I would say there's something on, on Liber v, uh, uh, five very regularly, Liber V very regularly. There's another of this scholion which are fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, it really and it really tells you what magic was supposed to be mm -hmm. in Crowley's mind, right? Uh, and as you mentioned, like the the knowledge and conversation with Holy Guardian Angel, it's incredibly personal. In Liber one eighty five, which was one of the um, constitutions of the AA of the Argentum Astrum. It clearly tells you that something along the line, I don't remember verbatim, but something along the line is um, no one can tell you the name of your god or the ritual to know him, right? So the, it's the magician that should eventually come up with its own ritual um, and its own understanding of how to get to God. And by the way, that is the nature of the Holy Garden Angel. The Holy Garden Angel is not uh, Set, is not uh, Jupiter, is not, I don't know, Archangel Michael, is nothing like this. The Holy Garden Angel is God. <laughs> it's the union with God. Crowley makes it incredibly clear in, uh, in um, Liber 333 and across his uh, corpus that uh, the knowledge and conversation with the Holy Garden Angel is the same as Samadhi. Uh, Samadhi in yoga is union with God. That's it, right? Um, that is the first and most important, I would say first, maybe one of the most important um, initiations in Telema. Without that step, you cannot then try and attempt the second step, the second initiation, which is something a lot of you have heard, the crossing of the abyss, which is something that maybe we should have another discussion another time about this. <laughs> but you know, that's, that's something that, it's almost like you, you start from two, you know, you and the universe, you and uh, the other people around you. And you start from this uh, understanding of you as a part of the universe around you. But then in the knowledge and conversation, you become one with the universe. So you go from two to one, okay? The true aim of Telema is going from one to zero, crossing the abyss, annihilating completely your ego, including your connection with God, the Holy Garden Angel, to be reborn under the Knight of Pan, as Crowley mentions it in the city of the pyramids. But again, this is not something that <laughs> we can touch upon now. But just to right. give it, yeah, you know, the steps that where how the steps should be, pretty much. I've always appreciated the fact that Crowley came from a uh, you know the Plymouth Brethren, which was a hardcore Protestant, born again Christian family, <laughs> and that basically he comes back to one. It, it's it's born again yeah. to born again. I've always appreciated yeah. that uh, we never get far, we never get too terribly far from where we start. Uh, we we. Reach, I, I, we, yeah. we we redress yeah. it a lot. Uh, a lot said, we never wash off our baptism. And I've always yeah. appreciated the fact that uh, he went from born again to born again. Uh, at yeah, some level. absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, so from a practitioner point of view, uh, Marco, um, and again, this is a, this is a, a sort of a big question and but I'm, I want to get your thoughts on it. Um, I kind of see, I don't know if you've ever heard the concept of a Wittgensteinian ladder. Um, mm -hmm. A Wittgenstein's, Wittgenstein's ladder, right, is the idea that there are some ideas you need to get to other ideas, but once you get there, you don't need those ideas anymore. There are provisional ideas that are really important to get you somewhere, but you know, uh, but once you get there, those ideas actually turn out to be even sometimes incorrect or or, or not valuable uh, or useful when you you get there. And so I'm wondering about maybe Libra Samech might function the same way yeah. that it's sort of like a that you could that one could be advised to do it because it's it's clearly had success. I mean, I, I read in Shoemaker's book and uh, um, Duquette's book and other people and talked to lots of people in real life and online who've had enormous positive experiences, transformatory experiences with Libra Samach. And I wonder that it's, you know, it could be sort of like a Wittgenstein's ladder. It's the kind of thing where um, it's a tried and true thing, but at the end of the day, you're gonna have to radically yep. personalize it. 
Would that would that be a, a fair assessment of sort of how it, it might be functioning in a contemporary thalamic environment? I mean, it's 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 an absolutely fair uh, assessment. I mean, Crowley says it in the sense that Crowley says that you know magic with the okay, this union uh, and all these rituals are only useful up until the grade of Adeptus Exemptus, which is you know right before you're ready to cross the abyss, right? So. It's exactly like that. You you are you are going up this ladder, you know, as mapped out by the Kabbalistic with the K with the Q, sorry, uh, Tree of Life. But at some point, you just leave things behind. Um, Liber Samic is definitely something like this. Uh, it's something that can be incredibly useful at the beginning. When you, I would say, I, I, not not so much at the beginning. For instance, in my book, uh, which is aimed at complete beginners like people that never even see uh, watch your uh, your um, your videos um it's it, it's more advanced than that's something for them like the, you find the liver stomach at the end of the book as an introduction to what might come up next because to really you know conduct a successful liver stomach operation well you need to know how to stand still you need to know how to breathe you need to know how to visualize you need to know how to vibrate you need to know how to do a lot of things that you need to get there but the reality there is that once you get to, to the point where you can do Liber Samic and maybe you stick to the plan, right? And Crowley says it, you know, the first month you do it uh, every week. The second month you do it every day. The third right. month you do it every Invoke hour. often. <laughs> exactly. Right. Invoke yeah. often, right? Invoke often, yeah. But once, once you've done that, you really don't need it anymore. And I would say that all, all this kind of, of magic with the K used... Uh, as a way of, you know, attaining the knowledge and conversation, attaining higher side of consciousness, it is something that once you've get, once you got there, you pretty much can find whatever works for you, right? My practice has changed drastically over the last almost thirty years now, um, to the point that there's very little that would be recognized as magic by a casual onlooker, but it. First of all, it, it you know I, I set up a goal and I reached the goal. That's always should be the litmus test of magic. But also, uh, it's something that should be like this, right? You start with something that's very regimented, but then if you are a successful magician, you create your own um, your your own language, your own grimoire, if you think about it, right? Your grammar of magic. So yeah, absolutely a fair assessment, I would say. And does does Libra Samach feature prominently in um, the study of of of, uh, of contemporary Thelema? I, so one of the things I'll, I'll say, and again, my experience with with uh, Thelema and Thelemites has always been sort of uh, rubbing shoulders more than anything else, is that you know the the text that you know obviously you hear about the most is the Book of the Law, and you know some of Book Four, Magic Theory and Practice. And it was one of the things that really shocked me was that, and I, and I think that magic and theory and practice is a, is a fine text and, and is uh, impressive in its own right. Mm -hmm. But I guess for me, and, I, and I'm showing my, my, uh, my biases here, you know, my biases toward philosophy, is that Libra Samach has always struck me as a much more deeply philosophical text in that way. And it's interesting that for whatever reason, I never hear people talk about it. Um, it's never the but text that- It's difficult. <laughs> It, it is it is a difficult text and I think you know that uh, that Duquette makes it clear that it's Crowley's version and and, and the and Libra Samach is a bit weirdly arranged and it, it should be laid out perhaps a bit differently to make it uh, more comprehensible especially to to beginners um but yeah it's one of the things that this seems to be sort of a I don't know what the right word for it is a uh, kind of a hidden gem of Thelema. and yeah. in fact you know if I were to uh if I were to put if I were putting together a, a um a text on contemporary occultism, I would probably put it in there precisely because of yeah. the the ritual components are there, the philosophical components are there, but I think even more than that, the phenomenological components are yeah. there. It really deeply describes the experience. Mm -hmm. Now, again, every experience is going to be radically personalized and we can't expect one experience to follow from another. Although he does kind of talk like that, I think, in Libra Samach a little bit, but I really do appreciate those three elements of, of magic with a K are all in Libra Samach in a way that um, I, I'm not quite sure that I see them in other places. So this is a kind of an unsung, at least in my experience, an unsung um, I uh, would tell classic you, of, of the Lima. I would tell you, like in, in, in when you when you formally get initiated into the AA, um, you if you proceed through the grades, you will find this text. And in, first of all, I should also say the AA is not a monolithic thing. Right in the sense that there are many lineages, and these lineages will uh, be very different from one another. 
right? So depending on who you're studying with, you might not get a liver stomach ever. But in the lineage that I'm part of, um, it was prominent, right? But it was prominent in the sense that, um, as you mentioned, like since it's such a beautiful, um, it really expounds the lemma under every aspect, right? Like if you study it, um, even if you study all the the very uh, whimsical changes that Crowley did to the headless, right, in order to become to become like the bornless one, right? So all those barbarous names that become very complex Kabbalistic uh, elucubrations by Crowley. Well, you know what? That was that's something you find a lot in Telema. So, so if you're interested in Telema, that right will will force you to think in that way, right? So it's something that you will find in certain AA environments, but that's about it. Um, Interesting. The way I've seen it in, you know, discussed in online or culture, um, again, depends where you go. Uh, if you go on Reddit, you'll find a lot of people that say that they read it once and they found out the Holy Garden Angel and the Holy Garden Angel was Batman. And that's all you need to know. Really. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, I suppose, right? Yeah, it's, it, again, it's just funny. And this is just an artifact of, of sort of how much of uh, the study of magic is autodidactic. And for so many people, yeah. is, there's a huge amount of unevenness in terms of overall education level, but also a, an enormous unevenness even from uh, institutions which promulgate oh, yeah. the material in terms of what gets read and what, what doesn't get studied, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, I, I, and again, that's just that's not a cr critique. It's just the way that these things it, go. It's the way it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's the way it is. So it's, it's, it's just, for me, it's... Um, um, I think if someone would have introduced Liber Samach to me, as opposed to, I don't know, something else, Liber Dragonum or whatever, where people were like, yeah, you have to slash your wrist every time you say the word I, I'm like, <laughs> you know, you're being like an edgy 17 year old. I'm like, if I, if I, if that would have been my first introduction to the, the to the flame, as opposed to, you know, some weird yeah, yeah, guy yeah. snapping his wrist with a, with a rubber band, uh, because he said, I, I would have had a totally different, um, uh, approach i mean not approach to it but i would have had a different appreciation for for what was going or what was going on there i guess and you know um, what? This, this is maybe why i don't think the structured approach to dilemma you know the the teaching order really works anymore because the teaching order really still tries to uh, impose a one size fits all right like you have to go to these grades you have to go to to study this thing first before or other but like you mentioned like somebody like you uh, which is more, you know, philosophically inclined, intellectually inclined, would have got a lot of more of Liber Samic immediately, right? I would still contend that in order to perform a Liber Samic, you have to have uh, all those, you know, all those years down of uh, pranayama, of uh, uh, asana, of uh, you know pratyahara and other things. But you know, it, you can still you can still um, appreciate it, and maybe you get an interest into that. But I mean, I don't like orders anymore, so that that's just me. <laughs> right? Yeah, and, I, and again, I've never had much experience in that way. It's just a, it's just the sort of piecemeal. And I have the, you know, the the blue brick in in front of me. So it's you know oh, the piecemeal way that I've I've encountered uh, Thelemic religious literature through my life uh, is often through the prism of who's introducing it to me and sort of what they're you know what yeah. they're up to and what they're going through in their own head, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, as opposed to me being me sitting down and you know pouring through this thing and being like, oh yeah, what. What's really jumping out to me about you know, what what, what, what do I find? Yeah, what do I find intellectually stimulating in terms of this material? Because it, it is it, there's a whole wide range of very very uh, powerful stuff here. Um, I was going to say there's some other there was one more question I was going to ask about or well, not one more question but um, no no it's slipping my mind. Um, what is it that uh, after Libra Samech? Um, you know, what's if, if if I were a person coming to you, um, Marco, who had just, you know, watched my episode on the Bornless Ritual and found Libra Samach interesting, what would be the the next text that you would point them in that direction? What would be a similar kind of of text? And I know that, um, and again, I'm, I'm asking from a philosophical point of view, not a ritual practitioner point of view, knowing full well that that one can't dive into to that that practice without having developed uh, other uh, magical skill sets. But uh, what other similar kinds of um, um, philosophically, specifically philosophically rich uh, Thelemic text would you would you point people to? Um, the one I mentioned before, it's uh, Liber Vive Regulae, um, which is interesting enough. It's one of those rituals that Crowley 
uh, suggest for the magician of any grade. So it should be in Crowley's mind, this was one uh, introductory ritual, right? And uh, it's a very interesting one. There's a lot of spinning, there's a lot of dancing around uh, the the four circles. But then there's again, once again, a third part um, whereby Crowley expounds the formula of Lashtal. And the uh, formula of Lashtal is one of those magical formulas that are absolutely fundamental to Dilemma. And it's the formula of annihilation in the sense that, you know, he, ex he expresses it as la, meaning not, uh, al, meaning God, so the O, and this, and this tension of polarity between nothingness and full expansion of all potentiality, which is, again, also found in uh, Nuit and Adit, which are two of the main, I struggle calling them gods because they're not really gods, they're like more um, processes of uh, vectors of transcendence that you find in Telema. And then you have in the middle, you have uh, uh, Shintet. Shintet is seen as, again, I know you're Jewish, so you will hate this. But it's seen as the serpent of fire, as in like the Kundalini energy rising up. And this idea of like, again, the only way in order to bring these things together and annihilate them is just by arousing the energy, the 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 divine energy hidden inside of you, inside your biology, really, and having that moment of realization. I'm terrible at explaining it, but trust me, if you if you like the the scullion of Liber Samek, you will love the the third part of uh, Liber V because it's really it, it's it's also Crowley at, at some of its most lucid. Like he really he really tries to make in in as clear as possible what Telema is about. And I think he, he does a fantastic job there. So again, I, I'm not going to butcher it, butcher it any further. So if you're curious, um, third part of Liber V, uh, it, it's it's the other scholion really. But again, like, you know, there's so much more. Like if you look into the holy books of Telema, again, if you, but then again, this is maybe less intellectual, less philosophical, more mystical. I have Liber Cat, Liber Ash, uh, mm -hmm. which are, a much more um, kind of like akin the ideas of like almost Sufi poetry in a way. This idea of you know longing for the infinite, longing for the all, and the union with the all. So again, maybe intellectually, philosophically, liber v, mystically, liber cat, liber ash. That's those are my suggestions. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Marco. Um, Thank you. So I have a couple of super thanks, and I know. Um, uh, Jason, I know that you had a question early on, and it's way up the chat. Did you, if you could mind throwing it back in the uh, the chat, that would be fantastic. But I just want to say uh, thank you for the uh, for the super sticker, Von and Vonf. Is that is that an Nokian? It looks, it looks like, like a, it looks like a Nokian to me. Yeah, it looks uh, like me as well. Yeah, yeah, it's like I, I, I can never quite ever read a Nokian because I'm not that good at it. But I see some stuff, and I'm like, that's a Nokian. I am um, terrible at a Nokian, so I would not. I would not yeah. say. Vonf. Maybe Vonf is winds. Maybe. Is it the wind of wisdom? Yeah, I think it may. This may be the beginning of the second call, the second Enochian call. Yeah. Maybe I don't know. Uh, but I thank you for the super sticker. If maybe you can uh, tell us. But uh, yeah, here we go. Yeah, Jason, um, go oh. to four corners. Who I'll be chatting with tomorrow. Um, uh, Margaret, do you have a favorite uh, PGM ritual? Um, I, I'll say mine. I, I really love the Mithras liturgy. I think it's my favorite text. I was about to say that as well. Yeah, yeah. We're... I mean, my uh, my consecration name as a bishop is Mithras, so I mean, it's, <laughs> it's exactly like yeah. I mean, it's the Mithras liturgy. It's fantastic. Uh, a few years ago uh, at the culture conference in Glastonbury, uh, Rodney Orpheus conducted a group uh, version of the Mithras liturgy, and you had pretty much all Glastonbury chanting these letters it was it was quite powerful actually so yeah it, it's it's definitely definitely one of the best um yeah, i wonder what, what, what i wonder if the old druids would have thought of a bunch of people using an egyptian an egyptian ritual in greek uh, yeah, I know, I mean, right? <laughs> and avalon I, I i just wonder like uh yeah i, I just I always imagine that all the ancient peoples are rolling in their graves they're like they're, they're <laughs> you know and it's funny like as we live in times where our culture is so uh, focus on ancestor worship. Our ancestors don't love us. <laughs> the way we're no, my, my, I'm sure my ancestors are like, like, uh, vote with the, <laughs> with the reading the necromancy always. Uh, I'm sure my, why don't you dive anymore? I can easily hear my ancestors in my, my, uh, my ear being like, oi. 
I, I see that it's like the 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 super sticker says we need more Grendel. I think Grendel it's a reference to the band I was in 15 years ago. Grendel still exists. The uh, Yoss is still doing great. Um, it, it keeps releasing amazing stuff. I, I'm the one who retired from music, but all my other bands they're still going. They're great. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, another one. Um, it's like Tini Dakini. Thank you. Do you Ooh. affiliate the South Node of the Moon Ketu with the Headless uh, God in the Bornless Ritual? Thank you. This is actually a really great question. Um, Mark, Marco, you may have something to say about this, but uh, um, Tini Dakini, I'm also going to mark earmark this question for uh, Dr. Kirsten uh, uh, Zwicky because she's going to be also be talking about the Inia God, specifically about uh, how among the Inia Gods there is an Akephalos God uh, and that it is tied up. Um, to this, but Mar Marco, do you have any? I think I think I will leave this question for for your other guests because um, I really I really don't work too much with uh, you know with the nodes, so uh, I'm actually very curious to hear what your other guests will have to say. So yeah, I'll learn more. I will, uh, yeah. So hold that hold that thought. I'll I'll ask her. Um, sadly, we uh, the the episode I was supposed to have with uh, with Kirsten was supposed to be out today, but uh, the. Uh, the evil diamonds destroyed my internet connection halfway through our conversation. And you we'll should invoke more often. That's the thing. Exactly. Yeah, I should. You know, I should have. Uh, you know, should have done the uh, bornless rule, which is cool because she she's gonna she works. Uh, she goes through every single line of the text as we have it, pointing to everything we now know about how that connects back to uh, Egyptian mythology as we understand it now. So it's it's yeah, gonna be. A, I mean, it's gonna be it's it's a really impressive conversation. If folks uh, aren't subscribed to her. Uh, YouTube channel uh, on ancient magic. It is absolutely one of the best. I mean, she can go, she'll take a single amulet uh, of Solomon and go through it for half an hour, picking apart every single thing we know about uh, uh, amulets and other magical that? documents. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Let, me, let me throw her. Yeah. Uh, of course, I'll be, I'll be pumping her out in, in a big way. Um, um, Dr. Um, I'll be really promoting her stuff because she's really kind of new to YouTube. And new to uh, she's on twelve. Put her Twitter here, because um, I know that some folks are on Twitter. But uh, she's just fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Great. I see Jason's also throwing her uh, YouTube channel in there. It's just the best content out there right now on Ancient Magic. Okay. Um, I, I will. I will. I, I didn't know. I didn't know about that. So I, this is a great thing about having this community. You know. <laughs> no, this is a great thing about this community is that you know we also don't know how we're connected, despite the fact that this. You know, damned algorithm is, algorithm is supposed to be connecting us all. Yeah, uh, it's, it's amazing not. how it's much really it silos not. us. No, yeah. but um, no, she's a she's a fantastic scholar, and uh, just absolutely wonderful. So, but uh, Tina Dakini, I'll come back to your question in the conversation with Doctor um, Doctor Swicky. Um, sweet up. Um, let's see here. Um, Marco, we've been going for about an hour and eleven minutes. Um, one one one. That's uh, Aleph. That's not bad. It's it's a good number. <laughs> that's a good number. Um, well, folks, um, do you want to take a couple of questions, Marco? Do you have a minute to take a couple of questions? I do. I do have some time. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so, folks, I have to acknowledge I haven't been totally watching the chat super closely, but if you have any last questions, I know we have a pretty good crowd here. It's like five hundred and sixty-eight people uh, oh, hello, watching. Everybody. Yeah, so it's a pretty pretty great crowd. I really appreciate uh, folks tuning in to to talk uh, my conversation here with Marco about the. Uh, the ritual, but if you have any questions, uh, feel free to throw them in here at the uh, in the chat now, and we can get to at least get to a couple of them before we have to sign off for the day. Um, but uh, folks, if you're not uh, following Marco's content, uh, make sure to be following his content. Uh, take a look at his uh, Marco. If you want to throw your Twitter handle down in the chat, yeah. folks can follow you there, and also maybe a link to your uh, to your book if folks want to pre-order it. I pre-ordered it, you know. Uh, Folks know this about me. I am not an expert in 20th century or 19th century occultism. My, I always say that my my, my expertise drops off dramatically in 1850. So my my uh, I call them sorties, right? I'm, I'm going. I'm running across no man's land when I enter the 20th century, and so I rely on folks like Marco to help me to make sure I'm not saying some something completely well, egregious uh, about you, the Lamar. You, you do a fantastic totally. job, you know that. So, <laughs> well, you know, it's it's even if you do a good job, it's also really important to admit it's not your area of expertise and to, yeah. you know, to thank people like you who helped to, um, to make that, uh, to make that happen. Um, so yeah, I got a, one super chat here. Any speculation Ooh. about who Hermes Trismegistus really was? And oh. Was he affiliated with the Ibis cult? Um, yeah. <laughs> where, where do we go from here? Um, what, what's your thoughts? Uh, 
Justin, um, do you have any thoughts, Justin? Of course, I have thoughts. Um, so I don't think that Hermes Trismegistus was a real person. Uh, I think what Hermes Trismegistus, the writings attributed to Hermes Trismegistus, are the result of probably relatively small communities of Hermetic practitioners operating in second, third centuries of, of Alexandria. Um, and it was very common for groups of people to produce literature and then ascribe it to a central figure in their community that they felt to be important, whether that was Moses or Jesus, for that matter, Hermes Trismegistus, etc. And so I think that what we have is a community of people producing a literature, and that literature is put into the mouth of this heroic, this uh, sage Hermes Trismegistus. Um, so I don't think we will ever know who's directly behind that that text or those texts. And also, it's important to note if you read the Corpus Hermeticum, it's not even one coherent body of no, literature. It goes everywhere. Yes. Yeah, well, some texts are very dualistic. Some texts are not dualistic. It, it's a real range. It's a community production, and just like any community, I'm sure everyone's gotten their family around their dinner table and asked them what they believe about religion, and you get, you know, the shouting match begins. Exactly. Um, <laughs> And, and so I think that what we have is not a Hermes Trismegistus who's a person, but we have Her Hermes Trismegistus who is a font of wisdom that is back attributed this, this wisdom to. And that's true of uh, Jabir ibn Hayyan, uh, the alchemical master in the Ismaili circles uh, uh, there in Baghdad and, and, and several other people, several other people through history. So that's my general thinking about uh, how this literature became attached to this character. I mean, I'm with you 100%. I also have found over the, the years, like there's a lot of a lot of ideas in, in magical circles where like you kind of really want to have a mythical story going. And something you find, for instance, find in Egyptian Freemasonry in the right of Memphis Mizraim is, you know, because as from you will know, in, in traditional Freemasonry, uh, the main story is King Solomon uh, and King Hiram and Hiram Abif, you know, building the, the first temple, then the temple collapses, and then, you know, the second temple is built 500 years later. But then, you know, when you go into the, the right of Memphis Mizraim, which, by the way, was the one that Crowley was most invested in, and one of the ones that really have uh, um, left a mark on Telema as well, well, they bring back the idea of this mystical begin builder much, much old, in a much older time, and you have Himotep, uh, the, you know, the the mythical builder of the um, Egyptian dynasties. And that's what Hermes Trismegistus began, uh, um, becomes at some point. You know, you go from Himotep into Hermes Trismegistus in the in the right of Memphis Mizraim. Again, it's it's a myth. Um, I, I, as I said at the beginning of this discussion, I like thinking with mi with mythical thinking in, you know, approaching magic. But as you, as you mentioned, you know, from a from what we know from the from history and from you know historiography as well, it's much more likely that it was never an Hermes Trismegistus. It was much more like a group of people coming together and uh, you know trying to create um, possibly a cult as well, right? You know, a, a cult of knowledge or or a, I don't know. You know, I'm thinking like if people will remember you know Justin's ledge as the beginner of of a, a mystical tradition in thousand years time. You never know. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> um, yeah, I like Jason. Jason Sobeck actually has it. He thinks about uh, Hermes Trismegistus as a brand name as opposed to historical oh, figure. I mean, it's like Jesus, right? Think about right. it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Many of the things that are attributed to Jesus, Jesus certainly never said. Some of which he, I think he did say. But, you know, did Jesus ever say, I'm the way, the truth, and the light? I don't think so. But exactly. did Jesus ever say something like, uh, um, abandon your father and mother and follow me? I think he may have said that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. So, and you know, like it's just like it, it was a. It, I, I really believe that Christianity, like the figure of Jesus, it was really like a creation of a brand. There were so many, uh, you know, messiahs, prophets, hap you know, happening in that time in that region, and uh, Jesus is the brand that survived. Uh, then again, I'm a Telemite. We don't like Christianity too much, so yeah. <laughs> I might yeah. be biased, right? <laughs> Yeah, and I, I always say that uh, this is my argument against the so-called mythicists. I'm like, it's not that Jesus is very strange if you're Jewish. There's yeah. lots of him. Like, we have mm -hmm. lots of miracle-working Galilean dudes. It, it'd be weird if he didn't exist. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, that would be the peculiar thing, would be that uh, if, if Jesus didn't exist, why would they invent this weird story that was just like all the other stories that we have from, or similar to Jewish miracle-working stories from the, the same time? Um, no, I hope that when I'm dead, I'm quickly forgotten. I don't know. There's uh, I don't know about you, Marco, but there's uh, there, of all the ideas that terrify me more than any other idea is the afterlife. The idea that I'll, I might die and then come back 
and have to do anything. Anything again, right? <laughs> anything. Like if I wake up and they're like, welcome to heaven, you're, you're here and everything is going to be perfect and you get to do the, I'm like, something's going terribly wrong. Uh, I, I don't know. There's uh, whether it's reincarnation or heaven or hell or, or whatever, uh, or even becoming the Elohim on other planet, a la the Latter-day Saints. I don't want any part of an afterlife. Uh, <laughs> well, I, then I wanna... you, you might be a telemite because, you know, a telemite, <laughs> a te a telemite view of the afterlife it really is that, you know, you attain in this life the knowledge and conversation, your true will. And then when you die, you decide what to do. <laughs> if yeah. you want to come back, you come back. If you want to go somewhere else, you go somewhere else. If you want to disappear into bliss, you disappear into bliss, right? So that's the, the telemic perception of it. Yeah. That, that, and again, at least you have some choice. I don't, you know, there's something about the idea of heaven that you get involuntarily brought back to life because you're a good person that has always struck me as ironic. It's quite, and it's also the idea that, I mean, I might be mistaken here, but maybe not, is that, you know, in the Christian belief is that, you know, when you're dead, you are dead. It's only when Christ comes back and, you know, resurrects yeah, everybody. You judged. You go, right. <laughs> oh, people say, oh, you know, like, you know, when I die, I'm going to go in heaven. I was like, no, 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 you're dead. You, you got to wait for Christ to come back. Yeah. And yeah. In you. fact, you spend most of the time in the middle in purgatory, I think. Exactly. If, if you're good, if you're, if you merit purgatory, if you're Catholic, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, so, all right. Well, Marco, uh, any last thoughts? Um, you know, a kephalos, bornless one, uh, Libra Samach, um, that stuff. You know, that's what folks are here. Yeah. Any sort of last thoughts? And we, we, all, we can always come back and talk about crossing the abyss and other topics in, in Thelema. And, of course, I want to have you back on to uh, chat about your book once I uh, get oh, my copy and get the chance to, to read it. So I'd love to have you on to talk about the book and, and things like that. But uh, any concluding thoughts on, um, on our conversation today? Well, first of all, um, I'm very, very curious to, to see if we, you know, if scholarship will evolve to a point where we can actually know more about the PGM. It's pretty clear that there's a lot more that can be understood with all the material we have today. And of course, um, that will inform our understanding of what this, what I think was an exorcism at the beginning really was about. Um, I also think that, you know, while we should you know, always keep um, our close attention on you know these uh, these evolutions from comes from uh, from our scholars. Liber Samix stands on its own, right? Really, so Liber Samix, uh, Liber Samix become one thing that is completely really it's it's completely separated from its beginning as the Akephalos uh, headless right. Um, I think somebody Bobby Hale in the chat mentioned the fact that you know the people like Alan Greenfield that created a complete different version. Of, of it, of, of Liber Samic itself, with more ufological kind of um, attribution. And that stands, that's, that, that works on its own as well. Like this ritual, if magician put them together, they, tap, they try and test it, and they did bring some results, well, they become their own thing, right? And uh, so Liber Samic remains uh, an absolute staple of telemic magic. As you said, it's the one ritual that where you can really appreciate all the complexity of what magic with the K really means. So this idea that you really have to have, yes, you have a ceremonial, but you also have to be have to have a, a regimen of yoga well under your belt. And um, and like I said, like it, it should it should definitely be studied and maybe practiced by everybody who wants to to have a better understanding of of telemic magic and what telema is. It's not for beginners. I would not suggest you to start with it. Uh, because again, you 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 possibly appreciate the the, philo the philosophy behind it, but you will really struggle with with all the tasks that that the ritual re requires to. But you know, like you you start your practice, and maybe a year into it, even you can give it a go. Um, that's it. That those are my final thoughts, pretty much. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, I I I really appreciate the idea that um, that we shouldn't expect religions to say the same. I think if you expect religions and religious rituals to say the same, you're a fool because yeah. religions are not religions. People do religions and people yeah. change. And uh, I find sometimes it's odd that people are like fault Crowley for changing the PGM ritual as opposed to like every ritual gets changed over time. Well, the Even the Catholic church's official exorcism ritual has been changed dozen times in the past yeah. 600 years. And the idea that um, that even an institutional body is rigid and as as a uh, as a uh, Titanic in both sense of that words of the, as the as the Roman Catholic Church, even they update their exorcism rituals. Again, the, 
it's a living tradition. You have exactly. to, to try and test it and make it better over time. Uh, right. Or maybe maybe or maybe not better, maybe make it yours. Right. Uh, if you don't make it something yours, if you just keep doing the rituals of someone else. I mean, this is a, this is a big problem in Telema, which is like, it's not, it doesn't, tell, it's not Telema anymore. It becomes Crowleyanity, like the cult of, of Aleister Crowley. We don't need that. We need people to be Telemites, at least, I mean, I do as a Telemite. That's it. Try it for yourself. Make your changes. See what works for you. Uh, and if it works for you, I will I will be happy with that, right? Uh, maybe but maybe I would say it doesn't work for me. My rituals should change over time. If not, it's a dead tradition. Right. And, right. Um, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. In fact, there's a, a whole uh, website actually we use in Judaism called Ritual Well, where people actually uh, take traditional rituals and update them and alter them, and they can upload them to this uh, database. Where oh, if, wow. you a, a, if you need a if you need a a different version, for instance, if there was a, a ritual that was only used for boys, but you want to adapt it for for girls, uh, people have written really elaborate, beautiful traditions that get uploaded to Ritual Well, and they're really amazing. So at least in, in Judaism, we at least progressive Judaism, we have this. Uh, the Orthodox guys are they're they're keeping on keeping on, <laughs> but hey, yeah, whatever. As long as it works for them. But uh, Marco, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, hang out with me here at Esoterica. Uh, you know, answer questions about uh, so Lema, and I, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, yeah hang out and 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 come you know converse mm -hmm. with me and converse with everyone else. Uh, these wonderful people here, uh, I really appreciate it. It's been a, it's been a great chat. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, that's it. If people want to find me, you can find my website at magic at marcovisconti.org and you'll find everything that I offer is over there. Um, that's it. It's been great. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> of course. Absolutely. All right, folks. I just want to say thank you. Uh, it's been a huge turnout today. You know, almost 600 people at some point. I really appreciate everyone who's taken the time to come and, you know, hang out with us and, you know, listen to Marco and I uh, talk about Thelema and talk about this, uh, these, uh, I think very fascinating, very beautiful rituals that have been developed by, uh, by Crowley and whether or not you think Crowley was an especially up, uh, you know, upstanding person, mm -hmm. turns out most people aren't upstanding. Moses beat a dude to death. Um, and so uh, I don't go to my prophets uh, looking for them to be perfect people. I go to them uh, expecting them to be people, which is what they typically yeah. are. And so uh, I really appreciate uh, the folks that have come out today and I uh, hope you join me tomorrow. Uh, Zevi and I will be at 11 a.m. We'll be back uh, doing our extended uh, Zohar uh uh, Chavrusa, our extended Zohar study at 11 a.m. if you want to come hang out and learn some Zohar with us. And then yeah. Friday, the episode will be on uh, the Arbitel, uh, a really fantastic text published originally in 1575 in Basel, which is a, a wonderful text of, of um, Renaissance, Calvinistic, and Paracelsian magic, a uh, text that Marco <laughs> knows like that. <laughs> yeah, very, very well. Um, so I uh, hope folks can join me on Friday to check a look at the, uh, the video on the, on the Arbitel. But until then, everyone, thank you so much for uh, for joining us. And I'm going to go out and uh, and shovel snow. So <laughs> see bye -bye. you guys. Yeah, bye, everyone. <laughs>